Hi, my name is Aiden Carcano. I'm Makaya Murphy. And you're watching the Bearcat News Network. stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for the Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Please remain standing for a moment of silence. Today is Mood Meter Monday. It's time for us to check in with another Mood Meter Monday. On a scale of Pikachu's, how are you feeling today? Girls track practice will begin Monday, February 13th after school. Students must have a doctor's physical turned in and, and all online forms completed in order to attend. If you have questions, please see Coach Jordan. Message from the librarian, Mrs. Camp. On the library door, there will be sign-up sheets for anyone who needs a new ID or needs assistance with their Chromebooks. Students are to put their names on the list, and they will be called to the library when is their turn. I'll be handling IDs on Mondays and Chromebooks on Tuesdays. Also, there are a lot of library materials checked out to so students that are that are late being returned. I am offering a grace period throughout February, during which time the students will be allowed to return any late materials without fines. I am offering a grace period throughout February, during which time the students will, will be allowed to return any late materials without fines. Starting March 1st, fines will be assessed to any late returns. Teachers, please remind your students to, get, to check out the book of the week and the quote of the day in the library. In the honor of Black History Month, the school librarian, Ms. Camp, has a display on local legend, Jack Johnson, Jack was born in Galveston, Texas on March 31, 1878. He was the third child of nine born to Henry and Tina Johnson, farmer slaves who worked service job, jobs as a janitor and dishwasher. At the height of the Jim Crow era, Jack Johnson became the first black world heavyweight boxing champion from 1908 to 1915. He is widely regarded as one of the most influential boxers in history. And his 1910 fight against James J. Jeffries was dubbed the fight of the century. Here's a glimpse from the video that was banned around the world. It features Jack Johnson versus James Jeffries for the World Heavyweight Championship in 1910. <laughs> This is the last surviving film frame of a famous boxing match in 1908, a World Heavyweight Championship. 
fought in Sydney, Australia between American boxer Jack Johnson and defending champion Canadian boxer Tommy Burns. Johnson won. The fight wasn't even close. And the film displayed signature traits of Johnson's. His habit of taunting his opponents and flashing his famous golden smile while he fought. The reel ends moments before police stepped into the ring and put a stop to it, preventing Johnson from knocking Burns out. This is the night Jack Johnson became the first black heavyweight champion of the world, in front of 20,000 mostly white spectators and, more importantly, motion picture cameras. Copies of the fight film spread throughout Australia within days, replaying Johnson's effortless victory over and over at screening events attended by paying crowds. Pretty soon, that film was seen worldwide. And from the moment Jack Johnson's reign as world heavyweight champion began, a target was on his back. Commercial motion pictures and professional boxing both came to prominence around the turn of the 20th century. Boxing's format, short rounds fought in a stationary ring, lent itself well to early film, with its clunky cameras and relatively short film reels. Film companies would travel around the country projecting reels of prize fights in packed theaters and opera houses. Champions were celebrated as heroes, and that's because boxing, going back centuries, has been wrapped up in themes of identity and pride. This de facto line of segregation was called the color line. And so Jack Johnson, being the best black fighter at the time, struggled to find white opponents. Johnson, who by 1908 had already defended his separate title of World Colored Heavyweight Champion 17 times, was repeatedly denied a shot at the most prestigious title in the world, until defending champion Tommy Burns accepted his challenge in 1908. And you already know how that turned out. Burns's defeat at the hands of a Black American fighter disrupted that narrative of white supremacy. You can see this happening in how newspapers framed the fight. Reporting on Johnson was heavily skewed to appeal to white readers and overwhelmingly drew attention to his race, sometimes before using his name. Jack Johnson holding on to the heavyweight crown was just not acceptable in an era of white imperialism, Jim Crow, and global white supremacy. The search for a white heavyweight to take the title back from Johnson began the night he won it. Former heavyweights claimed they would come out of retirement to fight him and that a white man must hold the title. The most popular choice among promoters and white boxing fans was James Jeffries, a former heavyweight champion who had retired undefeated in 1905 and was named the only hope of the white race. Johnson, for his part, was ready to defend his title against anyone, the retired Jeffries included. Jeffries was out of shape and hadn't stepped into the ring in over four years. They had him believing that if he just trained a little bit and got back in shape, that he could win and get the heavyweight crown back for the white race. The pressure and the promise of big money worked. Johnson and Jeffries signed a deal, setting a date for the following year. White press coverage leading up to the fight depicted racist cartoons of an overconfident Johnson and predicted his downfall at the hands of Jeffries. This fight, hyped as the battle of the century, was to be a contest of racial supremacy. And, of course, it would all be on camera. The fight was set for July 4th, 1910 in Reno, Nevada, and a massive stadium was constructed, outfitted with nine motion picture cameras positioned around the ring to document and then commercially distribute the event. On July 4th, Independence Day, over 20,000 spectators crowded inside. They imagined that this would be the ultimate way to celebrate, to watch Jim Jeffries, their great white hope, beat the crap out of, you know, this uppity, unruly African-American who didn't know his place. Crowds gathered outside in cities all across the U.S. too and packed into theaters separated by race because of segregation laws in the U.S. to listen to instantaneous telegram updates of every round, waiting to find out if Jack Johnson, who nine months earlier knocked out challenger Stanley Ketchell so hard he fell down himself from the momentum, would lose his heavyweight title to Jim Jeffries. But of course, that didn't happen. In the 15th round, Johnson knocked Jeffries down for the first time in Jeffries' career waited for him to get up, 
and when he tried, sent him through the ropes. Jeffrey's corner helped him to his feet, which technically should have ended the fight, and let the former champ get punched in the face and thrown to the mat one more time before stepping in to call it. Johnson was once again the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, and the nation erupted. Violence broke out in American cities, where anxious crowds had been awaiting the news of the fight. And they called them race riots, but essentially it was white mob violence against African Americans. It became this kind of attempt to put African Americans back in their place. At least 19 people died the night of July 4th in the violence following the fight, with hundreds more injured. Fear of further unrest led to an immediate attempt to ban the much-hyped Johnson Jeffries fight film. Black press outlets pointed out the hypocrisy of this ban, like the Afro-American Ledger, which printed, it was a race question from the start to the finish, for which the Negro was not and is not responsible. The results, riots, deaths, and injuries lie at the door of the white man and his prejudices. The professional world noted that a real fight was advertised and a real fight was had. What, more or less, could have been expected? Police were instructed to break up screening events. White authorities were worried about the symbolic implications of the Jack Johnson victory being replayed. They worried that any demonstration of black victory and any demonstration of white weakness or defeat would undercut the narratives of white supremacy, not just in the United States, but in colonies like South Africa, also India, the Philippines. But the hype that surrounded the fight meant there was no way to completely suppress it. So it became this kind of Pandora's box and they tried to shut it. But anytime you make something illegal, you just push it underground. So they criminalized it, but they couldn't ultimately get rid of it. Congress banned the distribution of all prize fight films in 1912 citing the race feeling stirred up by the exhibition of the Jeffries Johnson moving pictures. But by that point, the film was notorious worldwide. It was the most talked about motion picture of its time, and screenings drew crowds for years following the event. Jack Johnson lost the heavyweight title in 1915, after successfully defending it eight times. His legacy of crossing the color line and becoming the first black heavyweight champion inspired generations after him. This is a picture of one of his greatest fans in 1968, outside of a theater producing a play called The Great White Hope, which was loosely based on Johnson's life. A legendary heavyweight champion who named Johnson as a major inspiration, Muhammad Ali. There are some new after-school clubs starting at Central. If you're interested in designing and building stage props, costumes, design, costume design and sewing for theater, 3D printing, laser cutting, filming, editing, production, photography, and more, you might want to join the engineering club, costuming club, media club, or all three. If you're interested, fill out a Google form at the bottom of the flyer it is located in the Bearcat and Necessities newsletter and the Central Students Canvas page. Meetings will take place from 315 to 5. Here is today's riddle. It's Time Rewind for February 6th. Two iconic figures in American history enter the world on this day. In 1895, baseball legend Babe Ruth is born in Baltimore. The Bambino, as he's also known, spends most of his career in Yankee pinstripes and is one of the first players inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Suffering from throat cancer in June 1948, he bids farewell to fans at Yankee Stadium. The only real game, I think, in the world 
baseball. Two months later, Ruth is dead at 53. Win just one for the Kipper. Actor turned politician Ronald Reagan is born in Tampico, Illinois on this day in 1911. Reagan has more than 50 films to his credit before transitioning to politics, first as governor of California, then winning election to the U.S. presidency in 1980 at the age of 69. Reagan dies in 2004 at the age of 93. That's Time Rewind. I'm David Mandel. And that's your Bearcat News for today.